everybody, welcome to another thrilling episode of Data Doubleclick. I'm your host, Scott Klein, and with me today is Ron Ortloff. Did I say that right? You got it. You awesome, it. man. I'm getting Off good. to a good start. Yeah, I'm getting good <laughs> at last names. <laughs> yes, yes. Cool. So, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, awesome, because we're talking about some awesome uh, technology here. Uh, but before we get started, why don't you take a second and introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, so uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. My name is Ron Ortloff. I'm a program manager on the Azure SQL Data Warehouse team. Awesome. And we're going to talk about, we just did a video with Kevin. Yes. Uh, on kind of the intro, what difference between Gen 1 and Gen yep. 2. All that goodness and all adaptive that goodness. caching, uh, yep. all that good stuff. And yeah. a ton of people watched that video. Yep. So we want to continue that because yes. uh, as you and I were talking before, there's a lot of uh, question around performance and, and you know, what are concurrency slots and things like that. Yes. And all that. So let's just jump in. What is concurrency slots? Just let's just jump in and sure, show us what sure, you got. Sure, sure, sure. All righty. Yeah. So we're going to start off the talk here today, um, kind of dive into the details on concurrency yep. a little bit. Um, so why is concurrency important? You know, that's kind of the first question people often ask. Um, you know, I've got this big data warehousing machine. Why do I, why does it matter? Right. Yep. And, um, you know, folks want to run mixed workloads. They want to be able to run things in parallel. Um, you know, oftentimes a single query doesn't use all the resources on a box. Right. So for, the, for those reasons, um, you know, being able to run things concurrently is, is certainly a huge plus. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, some concepts for concurrency on, on Azure SQL Data Warehouse. Uh, service level, you know, that's often referred to, DW6000C is, is a Gen 2 service level, um, DW100, Gen 1, yeah. that sort of thing. Concurrency slots, as you kind of mentioned before, um, it's basically a memory chunk of what we add and allocate to uh, a user query. So it's done via resource classes. Again, resource classes, that's another concept here. So is it basically based on the DW <coughs> I select, I get X amount of concurrency slots? Yes, is that how it exactly. Okay. Okay. X amount of memory, and then that's divided up into a series of, of concurrency slots. Yeah. Oh, okay, so yeah, yeah. so, okay, that makes sense. So if yeah. I get, I get, here's my DW, with that, within that DW, X amount of memory. Yep. And within that memory, you basically just divvy up that memory into, exactly. into slots. Exactly, exactly, ah. yep. yeah. So yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of what we're showing here. So you have concurrency um, slots that are basically a, a fraction of the total system memory on a machine. Okay. Um, so, and, and that total system memory, again, is, is dictated by the service level that you're at. Um, and then that's how many concurrency slots that we actually divide the memory up into for that service level. Okay. So if you think of per DW500C for Gen 2, we offer 20 concurrency slots there. So we'll take the total memory for a DW500C and chop it up into 20 pieces. Um, on DW100 um, for Gen 2, we do four concurrency slots per DW100. Okay. So think of like a DW200, you're going to get eight concurrency slots. DW1000C, you get 40 concurrency okay. slots. Yep. Can other people, so if I, if I, on, if I create a DW, uh, a data warehouse, and you create yep. a DW, and I say, here's my service tier, so I get X amount of, X amount of memory. Yep. It's divvied up in concurrency slots. When you, if you create a DW and it somehow goes on the same, can you touch my no memory? okay no no so different instances you have your own concurrency slots okay. yeah. that's what yep. I figured but yep. just wanted to make sure yep. <laughs> yep so looking across kind of the different service levels here on this chart um, you can see DW100 up to DW 30,000 C the number of uh, the bars on the chart here they show concurrency slots increasing across the different service levels okay um, and then you also have increasing concurrency so we have to have a minimum amount of memory um, to service a particular query. And that is dictated again by the service level and how many concurrency slots that we allocate per service level. Okay. So you'll see here, um, you know, at, at DW6000C, we're offering up to 128 concurrency um, on Gen 1 and Gen 2 today. Okay. Yep. Very cool. So moving on here, so resource classes. So resource classes basically do the classification of a user login to a set of concurrency slots. Okay, so indirectly now you're okay. controlling the memory allocation to your user request via mapping them to a resource class. Okay, there's two different types. Okay, okay. There's uh, two different types of, of, of resource classes. So there's first off is that there's dynamic um, resource classes. Those basically, as the name says here, it's offering a variable amount of memory per resource class. So as you scale up your instance, you're going to be allocating more memory to the, to the resource class. Okay. Okay. So, so, yeah, so, <coughs> I'm, so I'm sorry, back up again. So yeah. this is, so, uh, 
that resource class is tied to my how I'm authenticating to, to the data warehouse? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And that's so just, okay. So as, as you log in, then we're, we're establishing and, and mapping you to a resource class. Okay. And that, that resource, resource class has concurrency slots that are allocated to it. And that then is the memory grant you get for your query. Okay. Uh, okay. So, and yeah. how many, uh, how many, how do you determine how many memory slots that resource class gets? That's defined um, per service level for the specific oh. resource okay. class. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Yep. yep. I'm good. So, um, dynamic resource classes, like I said, they're going to offer a variable amount of memory um, per the resource class that's defined. The benefit with this is you can scale up or scale down your instance and get varying performance without changing any code. Okay. The, the kind of the downside with it, though, is you're not going to have any additional concurrency as you scale up. Okay. Right? Yep. Yeah. Static resource classes, on the other hand, so these are essential for um, high concurrency workloads. So you're going to want to allocate static resource classes for getting concurrency. Um, as you scale up, you're going to be able to run more queries in concurrently. Um, however, the resource allocation is going to be constant. So queries may run the same. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. So the big difference between dynamic and static is that uh, I, my, my amount of memory, so static, I, I just get a dedicated amount. Yep. Dynamic, I may, based on resources and workload, I may get m uh, more assigned to me. Yep, exactly. Okay. exactly. Yep. okay. Yep. So kind of bringing it all together here, take an example. Um, service level uh, DW6000C. So I've got total memory and concurrency slots then that are allocated to my instance. Um, as queries come in, they're going to be classified into resource classes depending on how you configure it. So in this case, a small RC query comes in. That takes seven concurrency slots on DW6000C on Gen 2. Um, a static 10 comes in. That takes one concurrency slot. Um, some more queries come in. A static 20 query comes in. That takes two concurrency slots. So you can see now as more queries come in, they're going to continue to consume all the concurrency slots. Ah, uh, okay. So the key here is, and the point that I want to make is, you can run, um, you know, a varying mix of dynamic and static resource classes. Even within static resource classes, you can run uh, different resource classes. Okay. So okay. it's all about sizing those resource classes to your query and how much memory it needs to run efficiently, and so you can meet your estimates. And, and you can tweak that, right? You can tweak that. Uh, yep, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Uh, it, it, uh, and at multiple level, I can tweak it by changing the DW. Yep. Right. Or, or change it by changing the, um, you know, the type of resource classes, things exactly. like that. Exactly. Okay. You got it. So yep. a bunch of dials and knobs to go. Okay. To <laughs> fine tune this sweet yeah. sucker, right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. So here I've got a quick demo. Let's go ahead and fire this up. So just to kind of set up the demo a little bit, um, I've got two classes of users that I'm going to run here. So think of someone doing like exec reports, and then also running dashboard queries. So each one of these audiences, these populations, are going to submit 75 um, concurrent requests amongst them. Um, to kind of prove the point here around how resource classes work, we're going to toggle between static RC10 and small RC. Okay. And we'll see how the system behaves and how All things right. queue okay. and, and that sort of thing. Okay? Okay, perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and fire up. I've got a couple Azure functions here. Kick these guys off. I mean, what, uh, what are these Azure functions doing? So they're they're basically kicking off concurrent requests. Oh, to so 75 and 75. 75 and 75. Ah, gotcha. Yep. Okay. One of those Azure functions is in essence the exec reporting crowd, yep. and the other one is simulating the dashboard reporting crowd. Awesome. Okay. okay. Good. Yep. So these guys are up and running now. Okay. So take a look. I've got this view here then that that displays the um, the concurrent running requests and then what's queued. So we can see we've got 150 running connections now, right? So 75 and 75 from each of the audiences. Everyone's running under static RC10. Um, and you can see I've got 128 running queries. I've submitted 150 total. So now I have 22 that are actually queued. Queued, wait, waiting to be executed. Yep. Yeah. Static RC10 is one concurrency slot. So you see I have 22 slots that are queued and I have 22 queries that are also queued. Right, okay. Right, 22, 20, 128 slots are granted and 128 queries are also okay. granted. So life's grand, everything's up and running, we're humming along. Everybody's static RC10, okay? Okay. So <coughs> how I, so small RC is the, um, 
it is the default resource class. So as you come into the system, it, you're, everybody's initially classified into, into small RC. Okay. And the reason we've done that, especially on Gen 2, is as you scale up, we want that default experience to be good. Yep. Right. So it's, it's a dynamic resource class. As you scale up, you're going to see additional performance without changing anything on the system. Okay, cool. If you want to configure this for concurrency, um, drop somebody into static RC10, and you'll see the type of concurrency that we're seeing here. Today. Okay. So that's why with this query here where I actually dropped the role member out of the static RC10, I'm basically taking him out of the static RC10 and allowing him to fall into the default small RC. Ah, so it's, okay. a bit, it's a bit backwards, but um, <laughs> that, that's basically okay. what's happening here. So again, I can check resource class assignments now, and I can see the exec reporting group has fallen into small RC. Okay. All yeah. right. Um, dashboard guys continue on static okay. RC10. Yep. Yep. So now we can take go back to our monitor query here. Now we can see we've got two entries, and we can start to see things queuing up a little bit more. All right, I've got 79 queries still running on, st on static RC10, so some of those exact reporting queries are still finishing up on, yep. on static RC10. Uh, and then now I've got 23 running queries that I've already kicked off right. with small RC. So okay. their slot grants and their queues are now running a little bit higher, um, and we're seeing the additional queuing going up. Would I use this uh, view to go, hey, I, too many are stacking up. I may need to bump them from a static to, to higher to get better performance. Is that how you would read this? Yeah, or? I mean, you want to understand what's causing you to queue and what's causing queries not to be running, right? right? Um, usually you should size your, your queries to a resource class that allows you to meet your SLAs. Okay. Um, that's assigning a certain amount of memory that you feel you need to actually execute execute your queries on time. So how do I, okay, and, and maybe I missed that. How do I say, okay, how do I assign that resource class or how do I assign that to, here's a query, assign it to this, this resource class? Yeah, so that was what I was showing in the demo here. Um, so SP add role member. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That okay. would move, yeah, that would move that. somebody from static RC into static RC. Okay. From so basically RC. you have to add them to a role. Exactly. And that role says, here's your class that you can. Exactly. I got it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep, missed that, sorry, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was it for the demo. Okay. Um, let's go back here, um, switch gears a little bit maybe over to replicated tables. So when you talk about these large distributed systems um, and wanting to be able to run a high concurrency workload and get lots of throughput, it's key to make sure that you're making efficient use of resources. Yep. And what you have to do on distributed systems like Azure SQL Data Warehouse is distribute your data across all the compute nodes and make sure that you get effective spread of, of your right. compute. Um, with different distributions, you can end up in a scenario where you actually have to do data movement to resolve a query. Ah, yeah, okay, right? yep, I remember, and yep. this is now where inefficiency comes into play, yeah. your concurrency can suffer, your overall system throughput can suffer. Okay. So replicated tables come to the rescue here. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. So before we get into the, the nuts and bolts of replicated tables, let's just get a quick kind of level set on what distributed data movement is. Okay. So I've got a product sales table, I've got a sales account territory table. Um, they're distributed on uh, account ID and sales territory ID. So they're distributed on, on two different columns. So what that means now is, cr if you think of, of it from a node level, on the compute node level, and how the data is laid out and surfaced to those compute nodes, mm -hmm. You'll see here where I have like account ID that's on node one for the product sales table, and it's actually on node four for the sales account territory table. Okay. So if I want to do a simple join of these two tables, what's going to happen here without data movement is I'll join account ID 47 to 37. It's not a match. The query wouldn't return any results. Right. Okay. So SQL DW knows this, and it instantiates a data movement operation, which then reshuffles and moves the data to a compatible format and surfaces it back to the compute nodes. Ah. Now I've got data that matches. Okay. Node one's got account ID 47 and 47. There is the data. Now I can actually resolve the query and return okay. the Is this new to Gen 2? Or no, is this is just standard, standard data standard movement, movement. Okay. operations here. And, okay. and again, we're talking about replicated tables. So all of this data movement operation is it goes away because the table is actually yeah, replicated yeah, okay. and moved to all of the, the compute nodes. Sweet, okay. So that kind of leads us in, what's a good scenario for replicated tables? And it's kind of two scenarios. So the, the star schema yep. version, right? So your, your dimensions joining to the fact that's distributed on something differently. Yep. And it's also your ETL master data. So we see yeah. folks 
replicating master dimensions and master domain tables inside of their ETL process and then joining those to transactional right. records as they come in. Okay, okay. So they're saving data movement on, on kind of both sides of the right. fence and seeing good results with that. Cool, okay. Just a quick kind of example here how you would actually create a replicated table. Pretty, it looks pretty familiar. You're just yep. specifying a different distribution syntax. Um, and then kind of under the covers now, how does replicated tables work? Right. Um, so let's walk through this kind of example here. So when I say create a uh, replicated table like I showed in that previous syntax, what actually happens now is we create a round robin table underneath. And the reason we do that is to support elasticity. So you can still scale and move your distributions around to different compute, right. and the replicated table is still intact. Uh, okay. Okay? That makes sense. <coughs> also, if I need to update that table, it's distributed. Distributed data updates happen quicker than cached Cache, updates. Yep. yep. So when that create is done, the round robin table exists. When I do the first select, we actually have a replication manager that then a ticket is submitted to. All of the data is resolved immediately from the round robin table and asynchronously that replication cache manager builds the replicated table cache. Ah. Once on each compute node. Okay, once on each, okay. Yep. Now any subsequent selects pull directly from that cache, no data movements involved, query speed will okay. certainly increase. Very cool. Okay? Yep. Any subsequent updates then, the cache is invalidated, the update is applied to the round robin table, the next select, the process repeats. Oh, okay. All right. Okay? So this is all seamless. This is all under the covers. Yeah. It's all abstracted from the user. You see the, the date dimension as the date dimension and all this stuff happening underneath yeah. the covers is completely transparent okay. to you. Yep. You don't have to worry about it. Cool. It's all taken care of for you. All right. Um, and, and we talked about, you had a, a slide or two earlier that kind of mentioned best practice on how to select our tip, uh, replicated table. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there really any confusion as to, oh my goodness, does, does this make a good replicated table? Or is that is, is this kind of a... Not hit or miss, but I'm going to try this. Does it work? Does it try that? You know, for for selecting the right table. Yeah, you know, we we do have some design guidance in our documentation that you can certainly leverage. Yep. Um, there is a bit of kind of tuning. You know, as you get into the larger amounts of li the higher volume, you know, that two to four or five gig size for your your replicated table. Um, and then it also depends on how often you're you're updating that table. Yep. So if you're okay. constantly in a pattern of load. Um, query, load, query, load, query, load, query, you're going to be constantly invalidating your cache. Okay, so that makes there, sense. there's other size aspects, there's usage aspects, there's a few kind of characteristics to take into consideration. Okay, cool. All right. So let's take a, a quick look at a demo. All right. Um, yeah. So what I have here, um, I've got the TPCH schema loaded up here. Yep. Um, let's go ahead and get this guy started. So uh, it's, it's Q2 from TPCH. Uh, it's, it's loaded here with standard uh, replicated tables here of supplier, nation, and region, and it's joining to part and part supplier. Okay. So this is the replicated table version of it. Kick that guy off. Um, it's already done. So it's a join here, leveraging the tables, as well as a subselect that's happening Holy cow. Um, down here as well. So you'll see supplier. <laughs> <laughs> nation and region. So you have six axes into, yeah. in essence, round robin tables. And that um, was still executed. Or replicated <laughs> tables. Yep. So that's a non, the first one was a non replicated type scenario. Yep. So, yeah. Holy so God. it's sa same database and everything. I just have the tables labeled here with RR to indicate that they're the round robin version. Okay. So you see those are here and here and here. Right. This guy's still going. Um, the replicated table version finished almost instantly. Right. So that's let's, awesome. let's take a look here quick what's happening underneath the covers. Um, we can do this while the guy's still running. So I put labels on these queries. You can see REPL and non-REPL version of it. Yep. Um, let's grab their request IDs here. All right. So if we take a look at the non-replicated table version first, this is the one that's using round robin. Yep. Um, so we see here now with the the PDW request step. So this is, this is the distributed SQL plan that SQL DW has to execute to move the data around, to get the data to join, to actually process it and return the result. Oh, so yeah, there's a ton of move so, operations yep, in there. So, yeah, you see all these broadcast move operations yeah. happening. A total of 29 different uh, movement operations. Wow. If we take a look at the replicated table version of that, 
<laughs> life is grand. <laughs> life is grand. Life Man. is grand. We've got just one. Okay. So, so you can see why this thing runs in a second <laughs> versus yeah. the other one that has. Because there's a ton of data movement. Data movement to, to move the data around, to right. cache it in temp DVs oh on the other compute God. nodes. Yeah. yeah. So you pay a little bit of cost up front to build that cache, yep. but once the cache is built, this is the type of performance okay. that you can So utilize. if you see a lot of data move operations or broadcast move operations, that's, is, is, can we, is, could you say that's kind of a bad thing? Or if there's a lot of them, it's a bad thing? If there's a lot of them, it's certainly a scenario where you'd want to investigate replicated tables, okay. right? I mean, the things we talked about with cache and validation right. and, and how you access the data, um, those are other things to take into consideration. But when you see broadcast moves, that's something that you want to... Look and go Yeah, you should associate that with, hey, should I replicate that? Yeah. At the end of the day, a replicated table is a persisted version of a, of a broadcast move. Right? Okay, yeah. Broadcast move takes the data and it, it moves it across to all compute nodes where it can be accessed. Um, a replicated table is just doing that once and persisting it yep. and allowing everybody to leverage it. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so better performance. So you have to look at, if I see a bunch of that, yeah, I better look at replicated tables. Yes, awesome. exactly. Okay. Yep. Very cool. Yes. All right, so this is awesome. So I love the explanation of concurrency slots, I think, because there was a lot of confusion around that. So yeah. thank you yes. very much for, for, uh, for that. Yep. Uh, and this, this whole, um, I love the... Uh, you know, and the replicated tables. I, I understood a little bit about that, and I yeah. think you know most people did, but I think that helps solidify kind of how we look at replicated tables. But Alrighty. I think this, the, a lot of people will be uh, very happy to better understand concurrency slots. Yes. At the very yes. So, Ron, very thank you for coming. Okay, you bet. This is My fantastic. Pleasure. Yes. Uh, everybody, hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I now have a better understanding of concurrency slots. Hopefully, you do too. And this replicated table stuff was fantastic. So, Ron, thanks for coming. Okay. Everybody, uh, thanks for watching. If you have, oh, if, if they have a question, uh, what's the best way to, like, get a hold of you or say, hey, you know what, I need, you know, can we put some information out on the yes, description? Yes, certainly. So yep, we could, we'll add one in here to the end of the video. Awesome. Yep. Okay. Yep. And there is, a, there is a Twitter SQL. At SQL DW. At yep. SQL DW. At, at Azure SQL, SQL DW. DW. Yep. Right. And so, if you have questions, there's people monitoring that. They yep, ask questions absolutely. through that. Yep. Awesome. Yep. All right. So, if you have questions, there you go. So, Ron, thanks for coming. Everybody, okay. thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.